Hello YouTube. In the last video on perspectivism, I discussed uh, scientific models, and I think this provides a nice segue uh, into um, a recent development in the realism debate. A number of philosophers have suggested that the use of models in science uh, poses problems for realism. Uh, and this is because scientific modelling uh, very often involves fictions. Scientists will build into, mo into models assumptions that they know to be false. Uh, and there are two main types of, of fiction in science, abstraction and idealization. Uh, in abstraction, some properties of the system are omitted from the model of the system. Uh, the properties are ignored, but they're not misrepresented. Uh, if we're studying the orbit of the moon, then a model of the Earth-Moon system may simply ignore the specific types of elements that the two bodies are composed of. So yeah, we're not saying anything false about the composition of the Earth or the Moon, we just don't include that information in the model. Uh, the other and more problematic type of uh, fiction is idealization. In this case, some properties of the system are outright misrepresented or altered in the model. So in our model of the Earth-Moon system, we might assume that the two bodies are subject only to gravitational forces as a result of their masses. Um, and of course we know this to be false because there are also gravitational interactions with the Sun and Jupiter, for example. Uh, or we might model the system using Newtonian mechanics. This is false because we know that there are relativistic effects. So uh, in, in these cases we have idealization and uh, where we are knowingly describing the world uh, in a way that is false. So um, yeah, maybe to give a, a more specific example of this, um, in uh, ideal gas models, uh, which are you know, Im important in science, uh, gas is assumed to be composed of randomly moving dimensionless molecules, where there's no intermolecular attraction or friction uh, between them. The molecules interact only through perfectly elastic collisions. And we say that a collision is perfectly elastic if the total kinetic energy of the two colliding bodies is the same after the collision as before. So none of the kinetic energy is converted into other forms of energy such as heat or noise. Uh, so that, that, that's an, uh, an, ideal, an ideal gas. Now, uh, ideal gases don't really exist. The ideal gas is a purely theoretical construct of fiction. Nevertheless, we have laws that describe the behavior of the ideal gas. Um, the ideal gas law is stated here. Uh, P is pressure, V is volume, N is the amount of gas, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature. This tells us, for example, that if the temperature and the amount of the gas are held constant, then pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So if you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure and vice versa. Um, now this fiction of the ideal gas is useful because, uh, well, first of all, because ideal gases are theoretically simpler than real gases. Uh, and also because under many conditions, the observed behavior of real gases approximates what we would observe if it were an ideal gas. So we can treat real gases as ideal gases. So it should be obvious how this bears on realism. Realists claim that our best scientific theories are true, uh, that the, the success of our best scientific theories justifies believing that they're true. But we find that fiction is ubiquitous in science, and it seems that fiction is actually kind of essential to the success of science. I mean, when scientists develop models of ideal gases, that's not just for fun, uh, that's an important part of scientific development. Perhaps worse, fiction uh, seems to occur in, in modelling, and modelling is exactly that part of science that is supposed to be most closely connected to the real world. As we saw in the last video, many philosophers would argue that general laws make no claims about the world, rather laws are used as tools to generate more specific models. And it's the models that describe reality. But it's in the construction of models that scientists uh, appeal to idealization um, and, and, and fiction. We want to understand the behavior of a particular real gas, so we model it as an ideal gas, even though we know it's not an ideal gas. Indeed, nothing is an ideal gas. So there are a few different arguments in the literature that uh, appeal to the use of fiction against realism. Uh, one argument uses 
the notion of realism as the aim of science. Uh, and this is presented by Mauricio Suarez in his article, Fictions, Inference and Realism. Uh, and he states the argument as follows. Premise one, all scientific representation is fictive or fictional. Models um, necessarily involve claims that are known to be false. Uh, I should note that although Suarez states this premise uh, it, you know, in quite a strong way, he says all scientific representation is fictive, it seems to me that the argument could still be made even if only most scientific representation is fictive, so you know, most models involve fictions. The important point is just that fiction is quite common in science. Premise two, the cognitive function of fictions is independent of their truth value. Uh, and the point here is simply that when creating a fiction, the author is not constrained by truth. Uh, of course, a fiction can be true. Um, you know, if, if we have, say, historical fictions, they will often make claims about the world that, that are true. Uh, but it, it need not be, right? It, anything can, in principle, be false. Even uh, if the fiction is historical, there's no particular part that needs to be true. So fiction is not constrained by truth. Premise three, if fictions are ubiquitous in science and their cognitive function is independent of a truth value, then science does not aim at truth. So science does not aim at truth. That's the argument as Suarez presents it uh, to, I guess, connect this argument to the realism debate as we've been discussing it. Uh, we would need an additional premise asserting that we should believe no more than what science aims at. Uh, so if, if science doesn't aim at truth, then we're at least not rationally compelled to believe that scientific theories are true. Um, you know, we, we need to extend the argument in that kind of way. So uh, what might we say about this argument? Well, um, first of all, it, it frames the realism debate in a rather interesting way. Uh, as you can see, it frames the debate. It frames it as a debate about the aim of science. Um, so this idea of uh, realism as the the aim of the, the aim of science is truth um, it was that was first put this way by Baz van Frassen in the scientific image uh, so van Frassen's idea is realism is the view that science aims at truth period whereas constructive empiricism uh, is the view that science aims at empirical adequacy truth about the observable phenomena um, yeah, van, van Frassen claims that the scientific enterprise only requires belief in the empirical adequacy of, theory, of theories. You don't need to go beyond that to truth in general. So the aim of science is just empirical adequacy, not truth, period. Now, my own view is um, that framing, it in framing the debate in terms of aims is not particularly helpful. Uh, for one thing, I just think there are problems with the very idea of there being an aim of science. I mean, it makes sense to talk about the aims of a particular scientist, uh, and maybe there can be aims of a research group insofar as uh, they can work as a tight-knit team and come to collective decisions. Uh, and in these cases, it's easy to learn about their aims. If you want to know what the aim of a scientist is, you can just ask them. But if we're talking about science as a whole, I mean, this is a, an extremely complex practice involving hundreds of thousands of people with very different goals. So I'm, I'm just not sure it makes any sense really to talk about the aim of science. Uh, and how would you figure out what the aim of science is? Right? Who could we ask? Who could speak for science as a whole? Um, so I, I, I don't really like to think about science in this way. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, so a, a second problem um, is, you know, well, let's assume that this talk of the aim of science is reasonable. Uh, and let's assume that science doesn't aim at truth, as this argument concludes. Well, why shouldn't science achieve things beyond what it aims at? I mean, whenever you aim to do something, you often end up achieving other things as well, just as a byproduct. Presumably, the same could be the case for science. Even if it doesn't aim at truth, it may achieve truth nevertheless. In, uh, indeed, the realist would probably want to say that truth is the means by which science achieves whatever it aims at. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, truth isn't a mere byproduct, it's involved in realising the aims of science. For example, if we say that the aim of science is the prediction and control of observable phenomena, well, the realist would probably say that science achieves this aim 
by means of truth, because true theories permit better prediction and control of observable phenomena. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very unclear why you would, you know, how the fact that science, yeah, just because science doesn't aim at truth, that's not, it seems to me, much of a problem for a, a realist approach to science. Finally, uh, it's worth uh, noting that this argument generalizes to a variety of anti-realist positions as well. This, this, this argument doesn't just pose a problem for scientific realism. So take Van Frassen's constructive empiricism, which says that the aim of science is truth about the observable phenomena. Well, fiction isn't constrained by truth about the observable either. Uh, indeed, most scientific models make false claims about the observable phenomena. Uh, if you take a, a simple model of a pendulum, this might assume that there is no air resistance, that it might assume that the only force acting is gravity. But there is air resistance, and actually air resistance is observable. Um, you know, you can, you can feel the air. Uh, so uh, on this argument, we shouldn't believe even that science achieves truth about the observable. But this would far, it should surely be, be too strong, right? I mean, m most anti-realists don't want to be committed to radical scepticism. When we make predictions and perform experiments, we're checking the theoretical claims against what we observe. Uh, we're checking that the theory is uh, true for what we observe. So this version of the modelling argument, if it's successful, uh, would seem to lead to conclusions that even most anti-realists wouldn't want to accept. Okay, uh, let's look at a, a somewhat different argument from modelling. So uh, one popular argument from modelling, presented, for example, by Jay Odenbaugh in his argument in his article "True Lies: Realism, Robustness, and Models," uh, uses modelling to attack the realist inference from success to truth. Uh, we've seen that the central argument for realism is the no miracles argument where uh, the idea is that the only way we can make sense of the striking success of our best scientific theories is by taking those theories to be true. Uh, there are different versions of the no miracles argument, but I suspect that any kind of realism is, is probably going to rest on some sort of inference from success to truth. Uh, the, the, the feature of science that makes us confident that it achieve, achieves truth is its success. Uh, and, and different realists will appeal to different kinds of success. Uh, so many realists think that uh, it's successful novel predictions that justify belief. Whereas an entity realist like Ian Hacking, he's not so concerned about uh, successful prediction. He thinks it, that it's manipulative success. So building reliable instruments, that's what justifies belief. But either way, there's some sort of move from success to truth. Um, now it should be obvious how the use of fiction poses a problem here. Uh, Odenbaugh outlines the general problem as follows. Uh, we have a model which makes good predictions, so it's very successful. Uh, but we know that, first of all, the model is false. It involves falsehoods. And second, the falsehoods involved in the model are necessary for the predictions to come out correctly. The model is so successful precisely because there are falsehoods involved. So we can't infer from success to truth. Success doesn't, in general, demonstrate truth. Uh, a similar point is made by Stathis Silos in his article Living with the Abstract. Uh, he focuses specifically on the entities described in models. Scientific models describe entities like ideal gases, frictionless planes, point masses, infinite populations, and so on. These are all entities that we, we know don't exist. Uh, now, the realist says, the striking success of science commits us to believing that there really are entities like electrons, black holes, mitochondria, but precisely the same argument would seem to commit us to believing that there really are frictionless planes and ideal gases and so on, because those entities are also involved in the success of science. Uh, I mean, you know, if we suspend judgment about the existence of frictionless planes, why believe the rest of our theories? Why believe that there are electrons? We can no longer appeal to success to justify belief because various theoretical entities that we don't believe in are also involved in that success. Okay, let's consider some responses to this kind of argument. Um, 
So one option uh, is to deny that talk of fiction should be taken literally. We often use apparent fiction to communicate factual claims metaphorically. Uh, so Arnon Levy gives the example of how we say that Thomas Huxley was Darwin's bulldog. If this is taken literally, well, it's obviously false. Uh, but metaphors like this are a useful way of communicating factual information. In, in saying that Huxley was Darwin's bulldog, I communicate that Huxley was a, a very fierce supporter of Darwinism, that he put up a formidable fight in an argument, and so on. These claims are true. So, so this statement that Huxley was Darwin's bulldog, it's, it's true. It's not really fiction. It's communicating uh, a true, true propositions, but in a metaphorical way. It's using metaphor as a means of communication. So it might be argued that in science, as in the rest of life, we use metaphorical claims to communicate facts. Um, you know, the, 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 the seeming fictions in science are metaphors, they're not really false. The problem with this kind of move uh, is, well, first of all, modelling doesn't really seem to be comparable to metaphor. Uh, you know, when we model light as a wave, are we saying that light is only metaphorically a wave? Or when we model the relations between species in a particular ecosystem, are we saying that the species are metaphorically predators and prey? Well, if so, what exactly is the literal meaning that we're trying to communicate in these models? With the metaphor of Huxley as Darwin's bulldog, we can specify the literal meaning associated with the phrase Darwin's bulldog. We're saying something about Huxley's personality and Huxley's behaviour. We're not really talking about his species. So we can specify the literal, in, uh, the, the, the literal meaning. But if we treat scientific models as metaphors, uh, it's really not at all clear what the literal meaning is supposed to be. What is the literal meaning of the, the model of light as a wave? The second problem is that scientific models are mixed. So there are aspects that we know to be false, but then there are other aspects that we want to treat as being accurate, as being just straightforwardly true. If we're saying that part of the model is a metaphor, why not all of it? I mean, it seems kind of arbitrary to say that one part of the description provided by a model is metaphorical, whereas this other intertwined part is to be taken literally. So the question is, if we're going to go with this metaphor response, how do we distinguish the metaphorical content of a model from the literal content. Um, so uh, there are a couple of problems with, with taking this line, I think. All right, a second response is that fictions in science are merely pragmatic. Uh, they're, they're not actually uh, essential to the success of the model. And one way to uh, push this conclusion is to argue that we can uh, take a model and we can create versions of it that are increasingly less idealized and we show that these provide a better fit to the uh, observed phenomena. So basically, um, what we can do is we develop models that are increasingly close to reality, and we show that they make increasingly accurate predictions. And this would show that far from being necessary to the model's predictive success, fiction actually makes it less successful. It's just that for pra pragmatic reasons, we can't really avoid uh, appealing to fiction. So as a, a toy example, suppose we're modelling the orbit of Jupiter around the Sun. A simple model will take just Jupiter and the Sun and treat them as point masses and assume the, uh, Newtonian mechanics. And that may well provide a fairly good fit to Jupiter's actual orbit. But we can then start making increasingly realistic models if we want to you know, get better predictions for what Jupiter's orbit will be. So first of all, we add Saturn into our model. Um, Saturn obviously interacts with Jupiter and so affects its orbit. And then we add the other giant planets. And then we might uh, assume general relativity rather than Newtonian mechanics and so on. Now with each step we have a model that provides an increasingly good fit to Jupiter's observed orbit. And each model we assume is less idealized than the last one. So this kind of case is supposed to show that the fictional elements of models are, are merely pragmatic because as the uh, as the amount of fiction is reduced, the model delivers better predictions. Now I think this is um, probably 
one of the more plausible lines for the realist to take. Unfortunately, it seems it's not going to work uh, for all models. It's not going to work in general. Um, this is a response that can be applied in particular cases, but as a general claim, it isn't going to work. So first of all, um, I mean, just as a, a kind of logical point, we know that actually inaccuracy sometimes gives better predictions. Suppose I'm planning on uh, going out for a picnic tomorrow and I want to know the probability that it will rain. I live in Cornwall, the southwest of England. Now let's say I have two models. The first model assumes I live in Devon, which is right next to Cornwall. The second model assumes I live somewhere in the UK. Well, the first model is wrong, uh, but it will give a better prediction it will give a better prediction than the second model. The second model is, is, is accurate. I do live somewhere in the UK. The first model is wrong because it makes a specific claim that I live in a, in a specific county. I don't live in Devon. Um, but it will still give a, a better prediction than the accurate model. So inaccuracy can provide better, better predictions. Uh, more importantly, um, removing idealizations will make a model less general and so it will tend to reduce its predictive power. We already noted in the previous video how there is always a trade-off in modeling between completeness, accuracy and comprehension uh, and so this is ki kind of the, 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 the problem uh, arising here that um, by making a model more accurate um, you're, you're going to uh, kind of make it less, uh, give it less scope, right? So consider models which explain behaviors in animal populations by appealing to uh, evolutionary stable strategies. A simple example of an evolutionary stable strategy is uh, the hawk dove case. Imagine a population um, of animals that can have one of two behaviors. The hawks will fight aggressively for resources. To, you know, to maintain or steal resources and they won't stop until either they're injured or their opponents back down. While the doves immediately back down in response to aggressive behavior. Now these uh, behaviors have different benefits, right? Doves are much more likely to avoid injury in the event of any conflicts, but they'll be less likely to retain their resources than the hawks. Now, an evolutionary stable strategy is a strategy uh, adopted by a population that can't be invaded by another strategy. Suppose all the animals uh, in the population were to adopt the dove strategy. They never fight to acquire or maintain resources. So you know, they have to share any time another animal comes along that wants their stuff. Now suppose a mutation occurs and a hawk is born. The hawk will fight to steal resources and it will fight to keep them. Uh, and it's pretty clear that in a population of only doves, this hawk is never going to be harmed because the doves will all immediately back down. So this hawk is going to do very, very well in a population of doves. It will be more likely to survive and reproduce, and so the hawk behavior will spread through the population. And so this shows that dove is not an evolutionary stable strategy. A population of doves can always be invaded by a hawk. Uh, now, Evolutionary stable strategies are, uh, are usually analyzed in you know, more mathematical terms, appealing to the resources of game theory and so on. You know, this is a very simple example. But what we have here is a highly idealized model of a biological population. Uh, we are ignoring the uh, details of the species, uh, the environment, the resources and so on. Furthermore, we would expect real animal behavior to be much more complex. We'd expect that real animals would adopt a more mixed strategy uh, showing different behaviors, different levels of aggression, depending on the context. Um, and it would be pretty easy to develop more realistic models. We could fill in some of the details and specify the features of some particular population of animals. But notice that uh, uh, as the model becomes more accurate, well, it will only tell us about that one specific case. As we fill in the details of the model, if we fill in the details of the environment and the resources available and so on, we'll only get um, predictions about one specific case and it will lose its predictive power for other populations of animals. So the idea that as we make models more realistic, they increase their predictive power, well, actually that's kind of questionable because many of the most useful models in science are more general models 
that apply to all sorts of uh, different cases. Right, a third response to the anti-realist challenge is uh, robustness. The idea of robustness is that we can treat the same system with several different models which have uh, different idealizations but certain common underlying assumptions which we assume are not idealized. Uh, so in robustness analysis we generate a variety of different models that share these core assumptions and we vary the other claims, so we vary the falsehoods. We then look for predictions that follow from all the models. If the predictions are correct, this allows us to be confident about the core assumptions. Now, e each model has different falsehoods, so no particular falsehood is essential to the predictive success. So we, we have uh, a situation uh, as sort of shown here. Um, you know, so in, in, in this case, we have core assumptions labeled A plus X, Y, Z, these are falsehoods, that entails a particular prediction P. In the second case, we have the same assumptions plus X1, Y1, Z1, different falsehoods, which entail the same prediction, and, and so on. And you know, we can uh, generate uh, various models uh, like this. Uh, so uh, Richard Levins has a nice quote which sums up the basic idea here. Truth is the intersection of independent lies. For example, in models of natural selection, let's say we're looking at how the fitness of a particular genotype will affect its distribution in the population over time, uh, the model, uh, one model might assume an infinite population. So in this case, there would be no genetic drift. Uh, obviously, this is an idealization. But we could create another model, which assumes a population of, say, one million individuals, which makes the same or at least a sufficiently similar prediction. And this may also uh, be an idealization. It may be the case that the real population has uh, more or fewer than one million individuals. But what this is supposed to show is that this falsehood, the, the falsehood about the size of the population, is not really relevant to the success of the model. Um, because a, a different model you know, making a, a different assumption about the size of the population gives the same prediction. So the, the question is, in this situation, are we, uh, are, we, are we justified in believing the core assumptions? Uh, well, uh, there's a general uh, logical problem uh, with this idea of using robustness in this way. I mean, we might wonder whether this really addresses the anti-realist argument. So th the idea is that with robustness analysis, um, you know, uh, the predictive success of the models gives us reason to believe the shared core assumptions. But but why, right? I mean, because even, even in this case, uh, the falsehood is still necessary for making accurate predictions. Uh, all we're saying is that different falsehoods can be used. But I'm, I'm not entirely sure why that would, uh, why that would matter. I mean, it's, it's still the case that, that you've got falsehoods involved. I mean, remember, the, the point of the modeling argument from the anti-realist is to attack the realist inference from success to truth. Since models are successful partially because of claims we know to be false, we can't infer from the success to truth, right? That's the idea. Now, with robustness analysis, we can take a model and we can show that some particular falsehood X is not essential to its predictive success because some other falsehood X1, X2, X3, etc., can be used instead. But it's still the case that some falsehood is essential. Uh, you know, we, we, we can show that predictive success isn't dependent on a particular falsehood, but it's still dependent on some falsehood. Uh, so it's unclear to me, just as a logical point, how uh, robustness is supposed to help save the realist inference from success to truth. It's not. It's just not clear to me how this really uh, addresses the anti-realist argument. Um, maybe I'm missing something. Uh, but a more practical problem is simply that scientists very rarely develop uh, models that are robust from all false assumptions. Uh, so uh, a model will, will often include many, many falsehoods. And we may make uh, a few other models with different falsehoods, but we'll still find, usually, that some falsehoods are shared between all models. So, you know, we never really have um, the, the, the kind of very clean situation 
depicted here where we uh, where we just have a certain shared core of supposedly non-idealized assumptions with all of the falsehoods being uh, different in different models. Uh, so just to, to illustrate this, um, Jay Odenbot in his article True Lies considers the example of models of ecological succession. Succession occurs when the populations in an ecosystem replace each other over time. Interestingly, there are patterns in successions. If you focus on, um, let's say, forests, well, you'll find that similar forests will follow similar successional changes and dissimilar forests will often converge on similar states. So they'll end up following similar successional changes as well. So from many different starting points, uh, we end up uh, getting similar processes. Uh, this kind of convergence is found in a class of statistical processes known as Markov chains. Uh, in a Markov chain, the probability of transition from one state to another depends only on the current state, not on any previous state. Uh, and uh, Markov chains can settle into a, a characteristic pattern even when they have different starting conditions, just like uh, is seen in the forests. So ecologists started to model forest succession as a kind of Markov chain. Uh, the, the details here aren't particularly important, um, but uh, Odenborg uh, considers uh, some, of the, some of the models developed by the ecologists Henry Horn. So in Horn's model, uh, his first model, uh, a forest is treated as a honeycomb of independent cells, where each cell is occupied by one tree, and the cell is the size of the mature of, of the tree's crown. And it's assumed that uh, all the trees in the forest are replaced all at the same time. Right? They're, they're, they're replaced all at once. Uh, furthermore, the probability that a particular species of tree will be replaced by another species is determined by the number of saplings in the understory of the current species. Uh, for example, in one of the forests that Horn analysed, he looked at grey birch trees, and he, you know, so he, he put each grey birch into a cell the size of the tree's crown, and he counted the saplings in the cells, and he found that there were 837 saplings underneath the grey birches. Uh, or at least you know, in, in the cells of the, great, of the grey birches. Of those saplings, there were zero grey birch saplings, 142 red maple saplings, 25 beech saplings, and so on. I won't give all of the details. The probability that a grey birch tree will be replaced by another grey birch can then be worked out. We just take it to be zero out of 837. Right? And the probability that a grey birch will be replaced by a red maple is 142 out of 837, or 0 0.17. The probability that a grey birch will be replaced by a beech is 25 out of 837, or well, that's about 0 0.03. So with this model, uh, we can make predictions about how the forest will develop over time. Uh, and it does provide, uh, apparently, a fairly good fit to the observed phenomena. But obviously this model makes a huge number of false assumptions. Uh, so Horn develops other models that have different assumptions. For example, he uh, creates models that don't assume synchronous replacement. These, these other models give the trees varied lifespans. And again, the, assumptions, the assumption here about the lifespans of the trees uh, are false because we don't know the exact lifespans of the trees, uh, but the point is it's a different falsehood, right? So, so we, ha we can um, do this kind of robustness analysis uh, and supposedly show that the assumption about the lifespan of the tree isn't important to the success of the model. The trouble is that there are various other falsehoods that are just not dealt with in this kind of way. So, for example, the, uh, the way that the probabilities are worked out, so the, the, the probability that you know, one type of tree will be replaced by another type of tree. Well, these transition probabilities are a very important aspect of the model, but they're clearly idealised. Um, and Horn doesn't develop a model with a different assumption about these. Uh, also, treating the forest as an independent set of cells, uh, or ignoring density dependence. So in a, in a real forest, the fact that the trees are uh, more dense in some places will have influence on the probability of the replacement species 
that's not considered in, in any of the models. Um, plus there are a host of external influences on the forest that are not considered in any of the models. Uh, so the point of this is just to show how difficult it is in practice to do the, the, this kind of robustness analysis on all the falsehoods of a model. Just because it, most scientific models will have so many false assumptions and constructing models and deriving predictions from them is not an easy task. You know, I mean, even even if even if you can create models for different uh, which ha which make different assumptions, assumptions, many of those will also make different predictions. So you won't be able to apply the robustness analysis. I mean, what what you need for this uh, robustness analysis to work is you need it to be the case that if you have a model which makes various false assumptions then you have other models which make different false assumptions for all of the false assumptions of the original model and they make the same predictions as the original model. I mean, in practice, scientists often just don't have the time to construct so many models. So, it's again, it's not clear whether, uh, you know, even, even if this uh, appeal to robustness works as a logical point, it's not really clear how uh, how often we're going to be able to apply this kind of response in practice. Right, a final option for the realist, which is defended by Stathis Silos, is simply to hold that the supposedly fictional entities really do exist. The entities aren't fictional. Science doesn't generally deal in fiction. Just as the success of science commits us to entities like electrons and mitochondria, Silos argues that we are also committed to the entities described in our models. We are also committed to ideal gases and frictionless planes and infinite populations and so on. It's just that these entities, like mathematical entities, are abstract. Um, so uh, friction, frictionless planes and ideal gases exist um, and you know, the, the success of our sciences demonstrate that they exist, but these things exist as abstract entities. We will never encounter an ideal gas anywhere in the physical world. It's an abstract object. Scientists study abstract objects because these objects are such that uh, if they were physically realized, they would have certain causal properties. An ideal gas would have certain kinds of observable effects and we would be able to manipulate it in certain ways. Scientists can learn how an ideal gas would fit into the causal order if it did exist. I mean, that's, you know, that's what the, the ideal gas law uh, tells us, right? We can learn from the ideal gas law the, the kinds of causal uh, effects that uh, the ideal gas would have. So the thought then, as far as I understand Silos, is that scientific theories D describe both concrete objects and abstract objects, and they capture relations um, of similarity between the concrete objects and the abstract objects. So you know, a concrete object, like a cylinder of neon gas, has a certain relation to an abstract object. So we can imagine uh, the same sized cylinder uh, of the same amount of, I of an ideal gas. Uh, the, the scientific theories provide us with knowledge uh, of the relations between these concrete and these abstract objects. Uh, so th th the challenge to the realist was that, well, we know that models involve fictions. We know that models describe entities that don't exist, uh, which means we, we can't uh, assume that the success of those models uh, is any evidence for their truth. Silos responds, well, actually, uh, all of the entities described in models do exist. It's just some of them are abstract. So really, you know, there's no problem of fiction in science because our best theories and models don't invoke fictions. So we can maintain uh, the inference from success to truth. Uh, okay, what might we say about this? Well, uh, I think the, the, main, the main problem here uh, is, well, you know, whatever the merits of this kind of abstractionist realism in general, uh, it, it really isn't clear that it helps the scientific realist 
with the uh, the the argument uh, raised by modeling uh, raised by fiction or you know, I mean he wouldn't want to call it fiction but you know idealization or whatever in modeling uh, so notice after all that caloric fluid and the luminiferous ether and you know, loads of other uh, discarded um, theoretical posits would also count as real but abstract on Zillus's view. Uh, so there's no doubt that you can model heat as caloric fluid, or that you can model light as waves in the ether. Uh, and these models were useful to scientists of the past. So initially, the trouble for the realist arose because um, she took some entities of successful science to be real, so the electrons were taken to be real, whereas other entities were taken to be fictional, like ideal gases and frictionless planes. We, we took them to be, friction, to be fictional. Now, under this abstractionist realism that Silos defends, it seems to me that the problem basically just re-arises, re but in different terms. The, 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 the problem now is that the realist takes some entities to be concrete and others to be merely abstract. And the question is, well, which entities are concrete and which are merely abstract? Right? We still need to draw some sort of line between the, you know, the, the good entities like electrons and the defective entities like ideal gases. I mean, we can imagine an anti-realist saying, like, OK, I'll grant you the existence of abstract objects for the sake of argument, but the point is we have no reason to think that electrons are anything more than abstract. Right? We have no reason to treat electrons as being metaphysically different from caloric fluid or the luminiferous ether. I mean, that's the, the anti-realist claim. And abstractionist realism doesn't really uh, do anything to help address that. Um, I mean, on abstractionist realism, we could treat all theoretical entities, including electrons, as being merely abstract. Or at least we could you know, remain agnostic about it, right? We could remain agnostic about whether electrons are concrete entities or whether they're merely abstract, like ideal gases. So uh, e even if uh, Silos's view allows us to maintain the inference from success to truth, well, we can't infer from the fact that a theory is successful to the conclusion that the entities it describes concretely exist. We can't, can't infer from success to concreteness. Um, but I think that pretty much any scientific realist is going to want to say that electrons are concrete. Um, the real physical objects are literally composed of electrons. Um, so, you know, this is... Uh, uh, an interesting position, but it's, it seems to me that it's not one that, that really helps address uh, the anti-realist modelling argument. Okay, that's uh, all I wanted to talk about today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.